Jonathan, first things first, how are you? I am very good. Looking forward to our record. That's very good to hear. So where I want to start is now, the previous album, Reanimator, was released, I think, in September of 2020, which was right kind of in the middle of, of the whole pandemic thing yeah. where, where it started. And you never really got to, I suppose, finish that that album cycle as you do as you go touring and all that stuff so what was it like starting a new record starting a new creative enterprise in a way what with that kind of lingering or did it even feel like that it was it was really weird um it didn't feel like reanimator really happened at all it felt mm -hmm. like um it just got lost in the the mists of the pandemic um so yeah, it was quite strange when we just sort of, we kind of realized we're just gonna have to make another one because we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know where to where to start, where to look, um, what to write about, what to, what to write really. So yeah, that was quite a difficult way to begin so quickly. What, what was the impetuous then to start? Because you could have, try to wait it out uh, with not knowing what the future would hold but no it, it became well we just had nothing to do and we, we knew there was going to be no festivals we knew there was going to be no tour um for you know we could you could see that it was going to be a year or two years and it ended up being well i guess sort of three but with the way it, the way our album fell in terms of time meant that we hadn't played at all since 2018 mm. and we've only just got back on the road now so that's four years which is crazy wow. yeah um so we just thought we, we we need to make another record so that we we get back in sync with the world really from you as a songwriter from your perspective uh what was it like because you mentioned you didn't know what to write and now um, you've always written kind of about the world what was going on and then last album you went a little bit more inward and now you say mm -hmm. you, you didn't really know what to write is it is it tough as a songwriter as a lyricist to come up with things to to write about uh i guess so it isn't really um i don't really know because I've, I've always been in this position. Mm. I don't think, I don't find it actually hard, but it, you do have to keep thinking about it. Um, and you have to always come up with something new for the next time, do your absolute best. And then everyone just turns around and says, okay, now do it again, now do it again, now do it again, now do it again. This is the, the seventh, no, sixth mm. record. So yeah, it was, I, I partly, didn't want to really talk about myself again on this album because I felt like I've always done that and I didn't feel as bad as I usually do and would, I just put a record out and I just I just wanted a break from me so that's partly why I started to write make up characters and use AI and things like that to try and um, get away from myself a bit yeah when when did the idea of enlisting what would be, would become kevin kind of when, when did that idea start to shape itself i knew that i wanted to call the album kevin's car <laughs> that was the first idea i had um and i stuck to it for like 90 percent of the of the writing time and then at the end the other guys never <laughs> fully were on board and then in the end we changed it but there is a song called kevin's car Right. And there are, there's lots of songs about Kevin. So that was the only thing I had after Reanimator. And it was like, it's making another album. I was like, Kevin's car, Kevin's car, Kevin's car, Kevin's car. Yeah. What was, what is Kevin's car then? Because uh, like you said, there is a, a song on the album. Uh, what is Kevin's car? What, what, what do you picture when you think about that? It's supposed to be a sort of um, fantasy that this boy has that, he uses to escape his life. He's, he's thinking about one day he'll get this car, he'll ride away. So he's dreaming about Kevin's car. But in the, what, that was what it was going to be. Mm. But then in the end, it kind of became like a place where it kind of became a metaphor for like feeling safe with someone. Like sleeping in the back of your car was kind of the, the way that he and this and his girlfriend, one of them, I don't know which one, it doesn't matter 
felt when they were with the other one it felt like i'm sleeping and you're driving and it's all okay and we're, and we're getting away so that's what that song's kind of about is like falling into somebody and just kind of saying it's okay now and then that notion of feeling safe or, or feeling yeah protected in a way i i got a sense of that from leviathan as well um yeah. so so this notion of, of feeling safe or and, and it can manifest itself in many forms obviously but but where did that come from and you mentioned earlier you, you were quite happy as you wrote this song you, uh, uh this album you were in a great spot i suppose yeah well certain things changed in my life over the course of the pandemic um certain relationships changed where i live changed things like that and i gen just generally a lot happier now than i was on all the other albums <laughs> okay so yeah well, that, well that's good to hear um let's jump back to kevin then because i think now i might be mistaken but i, I think the origins of it was that you saw something about ai uh, writing poetry which is kind of yeah, i think so kind of uh i think you refer to it as one step away from what i do so mm -hmm. uh, this notion of ai and and infringing upon kind of what what it means to be human and then I, i think i suppose from both sides why did that become a prominent thing in in, in your head or in the band's kind of collection? it just interested me and I, and i felt like can i is it good enough to to give me the same feelings when I read something that's written by a computer or written by Shakespeare or whatever. Um, and will that work for other people? And it just intrigued me um, because initially I thought, no, there's no way. And then almost immediately I realized, of course it can. And I just thought that was fascinating. And I also decided I wouldn't tell anyone what the AI wrote in my songs. So they would never know what if they were, you know, truly getting in touch with my soul or, reading something that came from LinkedIn, you know, I love that feeling of um, uh, potential. I love the fact that people can, it's all in the listener anyway, isn't it? You sure. Know, I'm only putting words together and so's the computer and everything else that happens is happening away from me. And I think it's quite cool. Do you think, especially in this day and age with uh, technology being as advanced that it is that that the line between what is real and what is artificial is almost indistinguishable i think it's getting very close now yeah well you, i mean there's the there's the example with it if it's just words yeah i think that line is crossed definitely mm -hmm. you know artistic words maybe maybe i mean you get those uh, news articles that are written by ai and people read them every day and they don't even know what, that that's what they're reading um so yeah, certain things are not quite there, but but it won't take very long. But the interesting uh, part of it, I suppose, then is is the creative world where where uh, AI can can make a painting or can, can as you say uh, write some words, but also I suppose compose uh, uh, compose music. So so yeah, it can. Finding that balance between obviously on the right, you've always had uh, incorporated electronic elements, but finding that balance between the artificial and the kind of the quote unquote real. Um, how is that? What is that like for, for you as a band to, to kind of find that balance? We never use the AI to make to write music, but you definitely can do that. We just thought that there was no point um, because we enjoy making music too much, you know. Um, but yeah, finding that I really like where where things that don't mean anything meet things that mean a lot. And I really like crossing that line and, and exploring that because it's like I say, it's what means a lot is really um, up to the person. And I think that's kind of fascinating. There is no thing that everyone agrees on. And sometimes people can find a lot of meaning in, you know, a, a, an error or a glitch that shouldn't be there or a mistake or, um, you know, lots of mistakes in art are kind of the things that people like the most and and things that aren't, don't really have meaning. People fall in love with those things. And I really like that. Because it's celebrating the imagination of the consumer rather than the artist themselves, which is really where all art lives. In that sense, though, was this a very liberating process where you where you didn't overthink too much in a way? Yeah, yeah. We wrote we wrote and recorded the whole thing in 
three months, which is okay. super fast. Right. So we were writing us. I was writing the songs, you know, in a day or two days, and then spending not long on the lyrics. You know, just going, this is what I think is good. I'm not going to think about all this crazy shit I used to think about. I'm just going to do something good, <laughs> and um, that felt great. Yeah. This might be difficult to answer, uh, but but where did this new philosophy uh, that's not the right word but where, where did that come from in in a sense what, what allowed you and the, and the band uh to kind of do that in a way but have you have you kind of because i imagine when you, when you when you are in a band and in a somewhat successful band there is some expectations there's some pressures from all uh, areas what kind of allowed you this time around to to not uh take those kind of distractions into account too much it was lots of things. It was the the situation the pandemic had put us in where we had to do it fast because vinyl takes a year mm -hmm. to get made now. Maybe you've heard. Um, sure, it's what, because of Adele, I think. <laughs> yeah, a lot of bands are really screwed over by that. And Brexit didn't help that either. Um, so partly we knew we had to work fast. We just made an album that we put all our energy and all of our high concept into. And we thought, well, we're not doing that again. We haven't. We can't do that again. Um, we all were feeling um, just quite good, really, because of things that had happened in our lives. As a, you know, a couple of us have had children and stuff like this, and the relationships had changed, and it just felt like time to do something new. We were just very confident. We knew that we just made five good albums, and we were just confident enough. And Alex was producing, which is another big, huge part of this, is that. There was no one else there it was just us four it was like let's just do it we, we can we can do everything ourselves you know i've done the front i've done the cover of the album on this one you know everything was just us and it just felt um f yeah that's quite liberating the fact that we we are so confident how did the decision making process go was it was it very streamlined that did, did, did all noses kind of point in the same direction or was yeah. there some some contention as well not really that not, not as well there was it's always a bit but when it came to things like what goes on the record which is obviously the biggest question when you're right. a band we just decided to put everything on everything we recorded everything we wrote so that's 14 tracks i think it's our longest record maybe and uh that was because there was no song that that uh everyone disliked which is usually there is one or two this was like someone or two of us like everything we've done which is great i mean i liked everything <laughs> and uh, i think that's indicative of the fact that we just felt relaxed enough that it doesn't matter if this song is crazily different to the first song you know the eighth song is is insane compared to the first it doesn't matter it really doesn't it's a sort of celebration of creativity what was the, if, if we can uh, kind of uh, move into the songs a little bit more uh concretely what 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 is one that you didn't expect kind of if if you let's say two years ago had to listen had to listen to this record which one uh felt impossible before or maybe a couple of years before but now uh, um, i didn't phrase that right but yeah i know what you mean um i don't know you know i think they all feel like songs that I've been wanting to write for a long time and maybe was too cynical to do a lot of them mm -hmm. in the past. So there's lots of positive music on there or there's songs that just don't have a darkness, although they actually all do, but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> like like Teletype or I Wanna Love Like This are just kind of songs about feeling good, which is, you couldn't get that on any of our other albums. You just wouldn't be, wouldn't be there. I wouldn't have written it. Would have wanted to destroy it in some way or corrupt it in some way. Um, so I guess those certainly those opening two are unusual for us. Well, especially it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, I want to love like this. It, it, obviously, sonically, it's all it sounds very very nice uh, but then if you delve into the lyrics there's a there's a lot of angst and and and, and kind of apprehension in it so so is, is that inevitable with your writing that there's always kind of that that yeah, other side to it that's inevitable with with feelings isn't it i think there's right got to be honest about 
feelings are never just one color, I think. But in terms of what the broad strokes of that is, it's super positive. Usually I would write a song about how the world's gonna end or you know everyone's gonna die. And I might put in, but I love you somewhere. This is more like, I love you, some bad stuff's happening over here, you know. <laughs> right, well, fair, fair enough. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a, another song that I want to delve in then uh, sonically, uh, Software Great Man, the la uh, final album on the track, mm -hmm. uh, on the album, uh, final track on the album. Uh, because there's a line in there, which I, I, I think uh, kind of covers uh, some of the other songs as well. I don't know how to get over this thing because it's always there. So, so that line, what, what inspired that line or where did that kind of come from? Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty honest and open line, really. It's a, a lot of the music on the record is about trying to deal with something bad that's happened and different ways to deal with it. So getting, you know, pissed out of your head or using computers and technology to take over or finding a new person to hold on to, lots of different coping mechanisms. And um, that song was written at a time when I felt that I couldn't, cope with that thing but okay. I think ma in making the record I don't feel like that now so that's kind of why I made the record you know this is maybe way too broad a, a question but what motivates you what what kind of gets you to do this what the thing that you're doing this songwriting this kind of expressing yourself in in, in this manner I just have ideas 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 all the time the, the day I I finished the last video for Raw Data Feel. So that's one that hasn't come out yet. Um, it was about three days ago. And on that day, I reopened my animation program and des decided to start a major new uh, project okay. because I, I have all these ideas that I, I can't stop really. As, and I've always been like that. So it's what I love doing. I'd be happy living in a cave if I had a laptop with all my programs on it to make music and make film. Honestly, I don't need anything else. <laughs> okay. But with that in mind then, because we're, we are talking about technology in some sense, are, are you very dependent on technology? As you mentioned, if you had yeah. a laptop uh, with you, then you'd be fine. Yeah, of course I am completely. And I have always jumped into technology as far as I can long before okay everyone had computers. I had one, you know, when I was okay. 10 and I had a phone as soon as I could and I've always been like that. Um, I don't have to be at the very forefront of it, but I always use it very, uh, I always push it really far. Like my laptop's always overheating. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what, what is the... Pool, you know? <laughs> What is the pool then? Is it, is it kind of the frontier or the unknown of it, of it all? That where to push it or the where, where it can that, go? Mm. It's the potential that you can use it to bring your ideas out onto the the page or onto the screen or into people's ears, even if no one listens to it. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but I do think I would still be doing it because I was doing it before anyone ever listened to it. You know, and, that, and there's loads of stuff that I make that no one ever sees. Mm. or hears I think you just uh sometimes you just that's the way you feel okay is um generating stuff it's a very human thing I think we all do it well I, I mentioned before that there there there's another side when you are a professional band and and, and you you're somewhat successful it becomes a livelihood and people depend on you and all that stuff so so has that at all affected then the way you look at your own creativity no i don't i don't have anything where i look back and go oh i did that for any other reasons i think we've always been lucky with who we've worked with they've let us do what we want or um i don't think we I just don't think it would work if it, if there was too much. I mean, we have like a we have a commercial ear. We know sure. what isn't going to work, and we know what's more likely to work. But there's always like a a desire to actually make something real at the base of it, at the heart of it. We don't get very far being too cynical. You know, writing for writing specifically for people doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. I don't think it ever works with anyone unless they're in a 
a team of people who do that on purpose, you know, mm. and you know what you're getting, you know, like um, K-pop or something. It's like no one really believes that those boys love, all love this one girl, do they? You know, that's just, it's obviously been made up. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Final question. <laughs> that's an interesting uh, take on K-pop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> raw data feel that those those three words um where did they come from well i had this i, I wanted it to be called kevin's car let's not forget sure <laughs> but um <laughs> it wasn't gonna fly all the way you got vetoed <laughs> no I, I didn't actually they were they were good about it i could tell they weren't happy but they just um in the end i wanted to change it i guess but the uh yeah, I had all this music that was about computers and emotion. And I want I thought that there was something that could be done that married raw emotion and raw data. Something about the term raw data just felt right. Mm -hmm. But I could I knew I couldn't just call the album raw data. So I was experimenting with other words I could throw in to um, bring the human element to it. And I, I, I was originally raw data feeling. And then I was trying to mock up a little square that had the words on to try and get the other guys excited. And I kind of got big, big, big raw, big data. And I was like, uh, feelings a bit too long. And I just feel. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, fuck, that's right. That's the one. When you perform live, obviously it's very raw and it's uh, emotive. And, and then there's a lot of, uh, it's visceral. Uh, the other side of it, is there a very, very conscious, maybe, maybe analytical side to it? Live, well, there is, we use a lot of technology live. There is, um, Alex has just started to bring his synths on stage now, the ones he makes himself. Okay. Um, so that's like a big step up for this record live. And there's a lot of, the thing about his synths is that, yeah, they're computers and yeah, they're gonna do what you ask them to, but they're sort of, if they almost feel like they are alive, to be honest to me, there's so much, um, there's so many variables that can, change and it's all kind of analog stuff like it's not just a strange black box with binary in it it's actually really happening there in front of you and you can you, you can almost you can't actually see it but you can you can imagine what's happening inside these chips yes. or whatever um so yeah i think that's the sound of that is actually a really good marriage of reality and virtual reality as it were <laughs> because yeah. there is obviously a performance aspect to it and then and there's, oh, there's yeah. a, an aesthetic to it so so is that at the forefront of, of your minds as well to to kind of create this this illusion is yeah. not the right word but maybe experience or yeah definitely there's always aesthetically there's always a big um it's always a big part of the process once we've done the music we start to think about how it should look and how it should look live and how we should dress and how we should be photographed and all this stuff yeah okay final question then um considering the title raw dad i feel and kind of what you've explained just now i can imagine and then kind of not overthinking during the creative process i can imagine that that songs maybe shift in meaning or shift or evolve over time and i don't know what the space has been uh if it's long enough now but have songs already changed for you i've certain no, it hasn't been long enough. Um, I mean, the singles have been out for a bit now, I guess, but I still feel pretty close to those. Um, maybe if we, yeah, in like another six months or once once all the fans know the songs and they've got their own ideas about them and maybe they'll, they'll start to change in my mind a bit, but not yet. Fair enough. Jonathan, mm -hmm. may I thank you for your time? Thank you. Cheers.